Well, praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Thank you, Father. He is worthy of praise, isn't he? Glory to God. Thank you, Father. I want to thank Steve and Corey for filling in for me when I was gone on vacation and when I was just gone on Wednesday. So uh, uh, just one of those things um, that we have to deal with sometimes. And so, uh, you know, I listened to both of the messages and and everything, and uh, I think that, uh, you know, my my prayer, my my uh, heart's desire has always been, you know, it was never to build a church. It was always to see God's word fulfilled in our individual lives. That when um, God would assemble His people, I don't mean just coming to church, but I mean literally assembling them for the function of the kingdom in the earth. Um, that as you know, as a leader, so to speak, and I, and I, don't, I don't use the word leader. I use the word leader like this, like someone who's out in front. Everybody wants to be a leader, but, you know, I'm sure when they were, you know, in the, you know, if you're a, a special forces and you get dropped in behind enemy's line as a leader, you know, you're a no-name person because they don't want you to, you know, all those kind of different things. But, you know, we... Um, we need those kind of people, right, that will lead um, whether they get glory or not is ir- irrelevant. They just have to make sure that the mission is completed. Amen. And so I- I'm glad you guys filled in for me, and, and uh, uh, I will, you know, everything just kind of flows and blends together uh, of, of what God is doing because you know, we don't really uh, let a calendar dictate us what year it is. And, you know, and it's good to hear different little things and all that. But if we really are uh, advancing with God and walking with God day by day, that it won't matter what day the calendar is because um, if, if we do that, we are just waiting for something. And, you know, and I don't want to get into uh, wordology about, well, our, you know, are we waiting for, are we, you know, like, seriously, God is after people. Like, it's like, you know, it's like the body, right? Every individual cell has to be right, but they all have to function together in order to make the life visible. And so that's what God is doing uh, in his people. And as we come closer to him, right? It will be a greater manifestation of who he is. Uh, it isn't about any longer that God has finished his work. He's, he's rested. And so now it is our responsibility to approach him uh, in new heights, new depths, new ways, things that we've not uh, necessarily even think about or, or express. And so I, I do have something to share, and I think it was kind of interesting. Elizabeth came out, I don't know where she was, and she saw Uncle Nate there, and she asked this question, why are you here? And I could hear the Spirit of the Lord begin to talk because I already knew what I want to share. I'm not saying this will be the title, but it could be a good title. Why are you here? Why are you here? And, you know, a few weeks ago, I don't know, three, four weeks ago, I don't really know when it was, um, you know, because I just do my daily reading or whatever and studying. You know, I, I remember a few weeks ago, Sherry had asked me, she's like, so when you used to watch sports all the time, how did you find time to, you know, you probably didn't read your Bible that much. I said, if I watched sports six hours, I probably read six hours. You know, that's just the way I was. And uh, now I don't watch sports hardly at all, even though Austin made me watch a football game the other day. Um, but it was fun. We enjoyed it. 
you know, but I can read 12 hours and have no problem, you know. Um, and it isn't all about reading and it isn't all about knowledge, but it definitely is very, very important because God uses his word to speak to us. He speaks through his word and all the different things. And I heard the Lord start to talk to me about when Jesus told the Pharisees when they were asking for a sign. Everybody wants a sign. Can, you, can, can we sign something on a date on a calendar? Uh, I, you know, we need a sign. We like signs. You know, um, I think in another place it says something where, you know, the Jews want a sign, which speaks of the religious folks, but the Greeks or the knowledgeable people, they want, you know, they want proof and knowledge and, you know, all that kind of, it has to work out. And so, but he said, you know, and so I kind of just was sitting on this that they were asking for a sign. And he says, you've already got the only sign you're ever going to get. And that's the sign of Jonah. You know? And so, you know, then, then I sent you guys the, the, the second video of, you know, from uh, Brother Mark Hamby, and, um, which was July. And Corey mentioned it, and you might have even mentioned one of them. Uh, I think I heard Steve say, yeah, I'd like to preach like him. I always, like, like I never really, like, I, I've always had a lot of, uh, well, no, maybe not a lot. Like, I've had favorite preachers and teachers, right? Because, um, like, this is, this is nothing, you know, no reflection on anyone. Like, it's just not everybody can feed me the way I want to be fed. That's not negative. You know, like, you can, you can fix probably the best dinner you think you can make me. But that doesn't mean I'm necessarily going to like it, right? So I, I, it's, just, it's just me. It's just something God deals with me. But God speaks to me like, why are you here? Like, to me, that's a message that was already laid out that I'd like to share this morning. But it goes along with what the brother said. You know, why are you here? Why are you here? Because if we're here just for our soul realm, we can enjoy that and God can bless it. But it'll just end up short of his rest. Let us enter into his rest lest we come short of it. Let us fear, right, to enter into his rest. Hebrews chapter 4. We don't want to come short of the fullness. And so God has put us here for purpose. And I don't need to, I'm not going to rehash what um, if you haven't watched the video, watch it. If you watch it, watch it again. It won't hurt you. Um, it really will not. And when I, I literally looked at this verse yesterday, and when Elizabeth said this, it kind of it began to remind me of uh, of the verse I, when I looked at this yesterday. <coughs> Excuse me. I seem to do okay unless I talk a lot. <laughs> okay, shut up. <laughs> But why are you here? And when we come to this understanding and knowing that God knew us, chose us, all those things from the beginning. And this, you know, and I was thinking about this. That when God anointed David, I, I was like reading yesterday about, you know, how he ran from Absalom and Saul and all the different things. I was just reading the different stories because I hadn't read them in a while, you know, because I always just can think about them. But it's kind of good to go back and read them because, wow, ooh, look at that little, because words and things can. But when God had David anointed, okay, He predetermined that he was going to be a king on the throne of Israel and that nothing could stop it. Nothing. Not one thing. Go read the Psalms and we get to find out that David said, oh my God, he's going to kill me. 
And we even know that he was he was prophesying messianically that even Jesus, my father, my father, why have you forsaken me? That was David that said that in chapter 22, but it was really Jesus inside of David, right? The Holy Ghost, he had gotten up inside. That's because there's only one spirit for everyone. You don't have a spirit and I have a spirit. No, it's the same spirit Paul wrote in Ephesians. And we all came from God. The cool thing about it is, it's like the jar of oil, right? You can keep pouring it out, but it will never run dry. That's God. That St. Clair River down there, I ne- like I've been here all, you know, 64 years, and I, you know, as far back as I can remember, that lake has never run dry. It's gone up, it's gone down, but it just keeps flowing, and it flows at a high rate of speed. Ice can form in it, all kinds of stuff, but it never runs out. But it could but not God. When he scooped into himself and he made me, made you, he gave us all the exact same DNA. And this is what David wrote in Psalms 139. You don't need to turn there. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought or formed in the lowest parts of the earth. Thy eyes did see my substance Yet being unperfect, that means there has to be an advancement in growth and maturity. You know, it's funny, I'll just stop. I, I got sidetracked yesterday a, a little bit because I was remembering about what he said in the video when he was talking about the drunkards of Ephraim. Remember that? So I had to go look it up. You know, I I need to know for myself. And something I have said all my life that Isaiah prophesied in chapter 28, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little, right? But the truth of the matter is that's not a good thing. It's for babies. And that's what the drunkards were crying out. You're going to talk to us like we're babies? Now, if you don't like that, then we could go over into literally the verse references Hebrews where it says, look, you ought to be teachers and still needing to be taught. Why are you still drinking milk when you should be having strong meat? No, that's what he's saying to us. Why are we here? Just to enjoy life? That's okay. But that's not why he sent you here. And in thy book, all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned when as yet there was none of them. And so David anointed to be king, no matter what problems came along in his life, even the ones he created or didn't create. It was a done deal. He had to be a king. And we've known this all of our lives, right? You weren't born, you know, any other time, but this time you didn't have a choice. You didn't, you didn't get a choice in anything when you came from God. He already wrote it all down. The only choice we get is to agree with him. Now, we'll mess up along the way and we'll do things we wish we didn't and all those kind of things, and I don't advocate it one bit. Sometimes we put glory on all of our mishaps, and that's not so good either. It really isn't. It becomes loopholes. It just stunts our growth, slows us down. (coughs) Excuse me. But what I want to share today, and I, I... I don't want to take a lot of time. I, I really don't. If you turn with me to Jonah. You know, I think I'm going to read it in the... Uh, the, the, the reason, it, and you know, the reason I wanted to share this, when I finally stopped and looked at it, and I was like, oh, this kind of reminded me of, do you remember what, like, what he was said? Said, uh, who are you? You know, um, what's your purpose? I forget what he was, he said there was three things. I, I don't really remember them all. And, and, it, and when he was saying them, it reminded me, because I always remember Jonah. 
because I shared, you know, many, many years ago, what I would like to say is, was a, like, a message that I'd never have forgotten. What's your occupation? Right? <coughs> Excuse me. So, I will give you the verse. If you want to look on your, uh, I'm, I'm using, it's in Jonah 1. It's a new, called the New Century Version. If you want to look it up. If you don't, just listen and follow along. And, um, and you know the story that the Lord told, uh, the Lord told um, Jonah to get up and go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because I see the evil things they do. You know, now, when, when the Lord began to, I, I really do believe this. I really do. This, this is for me maybe more than anyone else, but I really do believe this. It's for all of us, I believe. But, you know, it's, it's in, even in my maturity. You know what? We were supposed to FaceTime Rebecca and, and oh, you already are. <laughs> I forgot. So, uh, anyway, I, I'm one of these people that, you know, like, for, you know, whenever, I, I used to do this when I would drive down to work all the time and I'd get closer to the city and I'd see all the cars around me and I'd just see the magnitude of people and I would know that, God, how in the world are you ever going to change everyone? How? This task is impossible. I mean, you have trouble changing me, let alone the whole world. And the other day when we went, we were on vacation and we went to Disney, you know, the one day and we were there and, you know, and it's like, because when I read, I, I, I believe, okay? But then I let my eyes look around and I'm like, oh God, I believe, but you know what? It seems totally impossible. Totally. Why are you here? Why do you write everything down about you before you even came to the earth? Right? And so God wanted Jonah to go to a evil, wicked city. Now, what's really cool about this, remember in his message when he said that Jesus went to, and, and the cool thing is, in chapter uh, 12, chapter 12 of Matthew, it's the first time he says, the only sign you're getting is Jonah. Okay? And then in chapter 16, when he talked about upon this rock, remember, down around verse 13, right in there? But if you go back to the beginning of the chapter, it says, look, you guys know how to discern everything. You see the skies red in the morning, sailors take warnings. Red sky at night, sailors delight. You know how to detect. You know how to detect all kinds of stuff in the earth, but you can't even tell when God is in your midst. You get more concerned about yourself than what God is really doing. Impossible, huh? Man, I look at just the church folks and say, God, it's impossible. And I really do believe the reason God has allowed it to get into an impossible place is that so man can't ever take the credit. Only he can. He's determined it. In the Old Testament, this is what he did. He made a covenant with Abraham. He said, I'm going to bring him forward the promise. And then Abraham, do you remember this? What did Abraham have to do? He had to sacrifice five animals, three from the earth, two, two birds, right? A pigeon, turtle dove. Showed the heavenly, right? And then God was going to burn it and walk through the midst of it, wasn't he? But what did he do to Abraham first? Made him go to sleep. And the whole picture, literally, is that God has created a covenant where he put Jesus to sleep in the earth and woke him up so that you and I could become living sacrifices. How many want to be transformed? 
a living sacrifice. The only way to approach God is by sacrifice. We don't have to bring an animal. We have to bring ourselves. Okay? A living sacrifice. But the only way to be changed or transformed is to change the way we think. You remember when I said this a couple of weeks ago or a few weeks ago? Only speak to the things the way you want to see it. But be careful you don't ask for something that is for your own desires. That's James. But I was remembering when he was talking about, like, who are you? People say, oh, I'm, you know, I went to college, I got this degree, I'm an engineer, I'm a... I'm a whatever, you know, and I came from here. Then he says, well, then they ask, where, where are you from and who are your people? You remember that? You remember he was saying that? So if you look here, do you remember? So the boat got out, of, got out of control. Like, oh, Jonah, he ran away from the Lord. He went to Tarshish, right? He got on a ship and he decided to pay for the trip himself. Everybody, you ever pay for your own voyage that you later wish you didn't? Why did I get on this boat? Why am I riding this train? This is one stinky attitude. Why do I have it? And so the Lord sent a wind and the sea and, you know, the whole works, right? And where was Jonah? Sleeping. So then they cast lots to see who was the troublemaker, right? And we found out it was Jonah. And they said to him, verse 8, tell us, uh, tell us who caused our trouble now, look what he says. Look what they say. What is your job? Where do you come from? What is your country? And who are your people? And if you remember, like in the King James, it says, what's your occupation? What do you do for a living? And I always love this because this is what I shared many years ago. He said, the only thing he said, I am a Hebrew. What's your occupation? Overcomer. Crossover. That's, it literally is the word abar. It means to cross over. Literally, when, when uh, the Shulamite went to the door looking for uh, the, the king, he had already left. They were already married, right? They were already married. He left to go into another dimension, and she thought he was still there, and it says, and he was gone. It literally was the Hebrew word, albar. Albar. I'm a Hebrew. I fear the Lord. And then they were afraid. He said, they're like, what terrible thing did you do? And he said, well, I ran from the Lord. He wanted me to go here, but I decided I wanted to go there. I was on board with what he wanted to do, but I knew he wasn't going to do it. Right? And so listen to, listen to this. And so, you know, the, the winds got stronger. And, and what should we do to you to make the sea calm down for us? Everybody knows the sea here is humanity, right? And Jonah said to them, pick me up and throw me into the sea. And then it will calm down. I know it is my fault that this great storm has come on you. Do you remember this? When Jesus went to Caesarea Philippi, remember what he said? He went right into the middle of the city. And he said, this is where I'm going to build my church. Right in the middle of all the chaos in the religious realm, the political realm, the economical realm, all that is where I'm going to plant my life. Why are you here? Did you hear what he said? Just pick me up and throw me in the sea. Throw me in the sea of humanity. And we know in type, we can show the picture here where Jonah types Jesus, right? He was buried 
you know, he was put right into the sea of humanity. He became the son of God and the son of man all at one time. He was spirit and flesh. Purpose. God saw his substance. He wrote everything down. It was predetermined. Nothing could stop the seed. Nothing. Now you know the story. He got tossed into the he got tossed into the ocean, right? And um, a big fish came. Jesus said it was a whale, but whatever. Jonah's thing says it was a big fish. And he was there three days and three nights. All right? So the fish gives him a ride to shore, lets him out. Jonas come to himself after three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, fully understanding like seaweed was wrapped around his mind, seaweed, all the different things that are there that God had predetermined that Jonah was going to Nineveh. He might have called you to be a senator, a prophet. Whatever kind of things that God, a, a psalmist, all the different stuff, a mother in Israel, all the different things that God has placed in your life that he has predetermined that is why you are here. Not any other reason, not your job to make money. When you go to your job, you go to your job as the prophet, as the senator. I mean, I was thinking this morning when I was uh, getting ready. I used to say this all the time when I worked at General Motors. I used to, I had people that were close to me. I'd tell them, yeah, I'll probably retire early and, you know, go, you know, you know, into the ministry. And the Lord said to me this morning, seriously, he said, you retired early. Maybe only one year, but never did know how long. I never did. But I obviously retired early. Because I certainly wasn't planning that last year. Why are we here? He's placed us in humanity for a purpose. Whatever you do, do the best you can. That's why we're here. It's the Esther thing. We came to the kingdom for such a time as this. And the reason Jesus had to tell them there are no other signs beside Jonah, he wanted them to stop waiting for something to happen when it had already happened. The death of Burial, resurrection, the ascension, the poured out life of Jesus into humanity has already been accomplished. And now God is after a people who show up on the planet to release or turn God loose the way he wants to be known. I know he talked about the keys, right? The keys weren't given to the... Now, me personally, I don't feel that way. I think we know, I think the saints, including myself as a saint, we have more knowledge now than we ever had ever about what God wants. The message, the doctrine, 
It's you know, like literally people, you, even if someone's end time doctrine is they're going to get caught up and go away. If you talk to them, they fully understand that Christ lives inside of them now. Well, that always wasn't the case. They were waiting to get somewhere to meet him. We need to have impactful meetings with him all the time. That our message or our doctrine or our belief system can move out of a realm of invisibility over into a realm of what we call reality or expression. Do you think David ever thought he was going to commit adultery? And kill a man? That's when he realized, oh, something inside of me has to go. I still say this, the biggest enemy David realized he was running from was himself. But we've come to the New Testament, to the New Covenant, where God has shown us very clearly, the old man is dead. There's no more signs. You just have to reckon him dead. Let no corrupt communication come out of your mouth. Watch what you say. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says if we fear something, it'll come on us. And the other side of the pendulum is, is don't be proud, because pride will kill us too. Jesus went right in the middle of Caesarea Philippi. But look at Jonah here. And the Lord, verse chapter 3, verse 1, and the Lord spoke his word to Jonah again. Aren't you glad for again? Like, I would never advocate anything David did, or even Saul of Tarsus. But I guarantee you they're more thankful than you can believe that, and this is what Paul said, I was a chief sinner. Like, I wasn't even worthy to be counted. But then he came to an understanding in Galatians when he wrote to them. He said, God separated me from my mother's womb. This is why I'm here, so that he can reveal his son through me. The only reason. Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh. The reason he didn't want to go, he knew it was a wicked city. And he understood that if God saw their repentance, he would show them mercy. And then he would look like a fool. Get up, go to the great city Nineveh and preach to it what I tell you to say. Not anything else, just what I tell you. So Jonah obeyed the Lord and got up and went to Nineveh. It was a very large city. Now listen to how big this city is. Just to walk across it, it took a person three days. I saw that it said it was 60 miles in circumference. That's a pretty big city. Now listen to this. After Jonah entered the city and walked for one day. Another place says he went right to the center of the city, which is interesting because that's what Jesus did. I'm going to bring my message right in the middle and there's no other sign. Don't wait for someone else. Don't wait for something else. 
He walked for one day. He preached to the people saying, after 40 days, Nineveh will be destroyed. The people of Nineveh believed God. I don't even know what to do now. I don't even know what to say. I stood in the middle of Disney World and I looked all around and I'm, I'm like this. I said, God, I don't think there's hardly a person in here who even knows you, let alone cares about you. And yet, one word could change the whole city. And in Christianity and religious realms, this is what we would do. Oh, we got a message. Let's go do that. And guess what? It's never worked. And the reason is because this is what Daniel said. The saints of God who know their God will do exploits. We have to know him. We have to know him. And the only way to know him is to pursue him, to seek him, to look for him. We've already found him in the first two days. Like Jacob, we have plateaued out. We have to go into another dimension. The only thing, listen, the rapture folks, the only thing that they misunderstand is this. They think that it's being caught up somewhere. All it literally means is God wants to take us into a dimension in him we have not lived yet and be here in the earth. The road, to, the road to Emmaus, the two disciples did not know who he was because they never encountered him. In the fullness of his resurrection life. That's where you and I. We have this great message. How come you can still get sick? Mortal body. Still a tent. Corruption. Nothing wrong with God's spirit in us. Oh, well, isn't it greater? It absolutely is. What's the problem? How do you know? Be ye transformed, conformed by the renewing or the changing the way we think. Because we usually only say things the way we think. There's no operation of going through psychological motivation. It won't, it won't change us permanently. But a change that cannot be undone. The people of Nineveh believed God. Now, can, like, I don't know about you, but that just like, like, he didn't want to go there. He, he went in. Can you imagine? Maybe, maybe uh, I, I don't know, I don't know. Obviously, he didn't change because if we get to chapter 4, like he had more mercy on the gourd than he did on the people. Remember that? They announced that they would fast for a while. There's something that should be done. I don't just mean food. I always remember the message my father taught us. When Jesus said, when you fast, right? Wash your face. Go out and live life. Like, you're not fasting. He wasn't talking about food. He was talking about the world. They put on a rough cloth to show that their sadness and all the people in the city did this from the most important to the least. And when the king of Nineveh heard this news, he got up from his throne, took off his robe, covered himself with a rough cloth and sat in ashes to show how upset he was. He sent his announcement through Nineveh. By command of the king and his important men, no person or animal, herd, flock, whole thing were to eat and don't let food drink 
Every person, animal should be covered with rough. Everyone must turn from their evil living and stop doing harm all the time. That was the interesting thing about Isaiah 28. They were living in lush valleys. It was a fruitful land. And they were drunk. They were called the drunkards of Ephraim because they literally were getting drunk. But if we want to put an, a, a picture to that, that's the way the church folks are. We become drunk on the Holy Ghost. Let's have a good time in church and then go out why we're here and never release the life. The word of the Lord to us and this whole church by proxy is to turn God loose. That's why we're here. But the only way he can ever be turned loose is that we have to get so close to him, abide in the shadow of the Almighty. He saw us. He predetermined it. I literally believe this. I can't help it, but we can't fail. But we can walk away. I've always given the keys to the kingdom. I've tried to make it easy for everybody. I'll study 12 hours so that you won't have to, but I pray that you get what he has for your life, why you're here. And everything we do in life is important. You have a job under the Lord. Verse 10 of chapter 3, when God saw what the people did, that they stopped doing evil, he changed his mind, and he did not do what he had warned. He did not punish them. Now, if you know the history of Nineveh, they just became a bad city again, and everybody say the cycle continued. They just did. And does. And this is why we're here. You don't need to run around and tell people I'm spirit. It, they'll just think you're whacked. But if you live it, right? And I fully understand. You know, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I had to raise my family and I had to do all those kind of things, you know. I can remember when I was building the house. I'd get up at like 5 o'clock in the morning to get to work, come home, do what I needed to do around the house, work on the house, get to bed by midnight, 1 o'clock, turn around, do it all again. Finally, after like seven months, I was like, oh, God, I don't know how much I can keep doing this. But I've always believed this, that every single thing we do in life is preparation of our hearts and minds to hear and obey the voice of God working in our lives. Yeah. 
I know I think I'm perfect and I do everything right, but I'm sure you don't. Actually, I don't. I'm probably more harder on myself than the rest of you are. Why are we here? The why, why, why? Like, I can get you, I can, I can go get you the, all the videotapes and all the messages ever recorded of what led us to this moment of even having a church, even having this building. Every single thing in every single way God was moving to get us here. To this moment in time. I couldn't have made Elizabeth say, why are you here? Now, she didn't say, why are you here, Uncle Nate? She said, why are you here? Even though she was facing him. So it can be personal, which it should be for all of us. But it certainly is for the congregation. I think it was Corey that said it. Like, I never tried to build a church, right? God is the one who has to do these things. People just not, you know, you can come half-hearted, they'll leave in a couple, three years, whatever, you know. But God is establishing, not by numbers, I certainly don't want to be a Jonathan or a Joab. I don't want to be mighty warriors. I want everything that he wrote in the book concerning all of us to be fulfilled in our lives. Blessed is he who hungers and thirsts after righteousness. That's not righteousness on a set of, you know, it's like he knew no sin, became sin, that you and I could become or be made the righteousness of God. This is what he's after. Do you hunger for that? Many, many years ago, when I still lived in my mom and dad's house, um, and I think, I don't know, Danielle might have been the only baby born at the time. And I remember God gave me a dream, and I probably have said it before, but everybody knows where the lighthouse is. And I remember one time, in, or I remember in the dream, there was this, like, out in the mouth of the lake, and it was pitch black, pitch black, and there was all these boats going and fishing and all that kind of stuff. But no one could see. They were all like, Ew. but every time that light came around, they saw it and they started heading towards the shore. Because they were lost. Didn't know where to go. He's calling a people. He's calling his people. You don't have to go chase them down. They'll come. Arise, shine, for thy light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. There is no other sign not waiting for any other moment. Jesus has come. He resides inside of you and I. We just need to get to know him in another dimension, a higher realm. Come up, come close. The whole point of being caught up is coming up, drawing close.
And the reason most of us struggle is because we don't prepare like we could or should. It's possible. I went to my old church for 17 years before they sent us out. Totally impossible would have ever thought it could ever happen. Because it was nothing but struggle and turmoil for 17 years. But at no time did I ever stop pursuing what God wanted or ever thought about leaving where he put me. All I wanted to do was to know him. And then when I had babies, I wanted them to know him. Better than how I knew him. Because in the economy of God of every generation, natural generation is supposed to get better, which it has, right? My kids are way smarter than I am. We didn't have an iPhone when I was a kid. We still had a phone on the wall. Can you imagine that, Jules? I was the remote control. My dad would say, go change the channel. All you have to do is go like this. Why are you here? Why are you here? Are we here just to, you know, I don't want to tell Titus, you know, <laughs> you know. A lot of people have paid a lot of heavier price than we have. We, we live in the land of good and plenty. Like, seriously, would you want to live anywhere else? No. Why are we here? Why are you here? And I really do believe it's a personal thing. Do you know why the Holy Ghost came? Individual. It has to be a personal relationship. But then when that personal relationship grows with one another, an entity is born. A life that expands. One will chase a thousand. Two will chase ten thousand. One man went in the middle of one city that was the largest city around. He went to the center of it. And all he did was preach the kingdom. The first message Jesus ever preached was the message of the kingdom. Repent. Change the way you think the kingdom of God is here. We're waiting for something that's already here. I can't see it. That's because we have to come up so that we can express out. I know he talked about the ladder and different rungs and I get all that and I'm all with it. But the truth of the matter, well, not the, another description I'll say, better yet, is like it's a picture of those angels ascending and descending. It's a picture of people's God. Angels, messenger, literally means messengers or people who have been sent. They know how to bring heaven to earth and make it palatable that changes things. But judgment or the verdict starts at home. Amen? Who would have known? Oh wait, God, he saw our substance. That we came to the kingdom For such a time as this. Why are 
you hear. Now God, take the word. You know, I wanted to say to God, stir it up. But you know what Paul wrote to Timothy? You're going to have to stir up the gift within yourself. Don't wait for God. Lord, I pray, O oh God, that it will be done according to thy word. That, Father, we will change the way we think. Not a new message or a new doctrine, but a new relationship. The revelation of Jesus the Christ through a people. The corporate entity of your life. That not only individually, but collectively a dynamic force in the earth. And I know, God, it seems impossible to our naturalness right now. But like Sarah and Abraham, able to birth a promise out of them when they were physically unable to do it, I pray, God, that you'll change us. Like you changed Abraham and Sarah. That the glory of your name, O God, would be known in the earth. Because there is nothing, everybody say this with me, there is nothing too hard for God. Nothing. Yeah, it's impossible when we look around. I thank God that we don't sit there and, 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 you know, let that become our focus. We're not blind, but nothing's too hard for God. Fear will paralyze us. Fear paralyzes. It makes us think incorrectly. But pride will kill us also. So let us walk upright, straight, fully knowing and understanding that he has called us and marked us for such a time as this. That we know the answer of why we are here. We're here to fulfill our destiny in Christ Jesus. So let it be done, God. In spite of us, so God, let it be done according to your word. In Jesus' name, everybody says, Amen.